Praise the Lord. God bless you. You are the chosen few. You're on time. Amen. Hallelujah. Who wants to be late for the rapture? I put my hand down. I don't want to be late for the rapture. Thank you for being on time. God bless you. Amen. Let's, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to pray. And then I'll let you sit down, but I don't want you to I don't want you to sit down and shut up. I just want you to sit down, okay? Lord, we thank you for another time of getting together in your name. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that your word would go forth with power and anointing, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for these lessons that you're giving us. I thank you for this teaching, Lord Jesus, that you're showing us. My God, I pray that this uh, lesson, this seed finds good soil to be planted in, Lord Jesus, and I pray that it produces much fruit in the lives of your people, Lord, and we will give you all the praise and all the glory tonight in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 Praise God. You can be seated. What are we talking about? Anatomy of a disciple. What's a disciple? What's that? What did you say? Okay, I got that. That's what you said too. Follower of Jesus, okay? Is everybody that follows Jesus a disciple? Ooh, that's good. I I, I like this. Got different opinions. Those of you who said no, why is not everybody a disciple who follows Jesus? Say it one more time. Okay, he says you need to follow specific steps before you become a disciple. Okay, anybody else? Why is it no? Because they're not, they're not humbly submitted, biblically based, and the rest. Commitment, no commitment. Obedience. Somebody over here? Anybody else? To be a disciple, you can be a follower. You can be a follower. I mean, a lot of people follow the uh, follow the Redskins, for example. But you're not a disciple of the Redskins. Commanders, thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Commanders, commanders. But you're not a disciple of the commanders, okay? Unless you buy all their gear. I don't know. But if we want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, one of the founding principles of being a disciple is to do what the teacher says. You can't you can't you can follow somebody and just tag along and not have anything to do with what they what they're doing or what they're saying or not do what they're saying. You can be following them, but you're not a disciple until you actually do what the teacher says, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn how to do what the teacher says, all right? Now, we've talked about what's the center part. She's already got that video up there. No, she doesn't. What's the, oh, man, what's the center part of that? Humbly submitted. And once you've done that, you're done, right? You, you're done with that. You don't have to worry about that anymore. No, why? Every day. Because you know something? You wake up in that body of yours every single day. The day you wake up outside of the body is a day that hopefully you'll be in heaven. Okay? But every day that you wake up in that body... This flesh, the Bible tells us, it is at enmity with God. And that word enmity means it's an enemy. There, I'm a, My body is in a battle with the Spirit of God every single day. They're button heads. They're fighting. So I've got to be humbly submitted every single day. So I get up. I submit myself. What's the next thing I've got to do? Biblically formed. What does that mean? What's that? My mind. 
Okay, what's, what's it mean to be biblically formed? Read your Bible. Okay, I've read my Bible today. I put it on the shelf. I'm biblically formed, right? Obey the commandments. Okay, so I read my Bible. I do what I can to obey the commandments. Am I biblically formed? We're not there yet. Hang on. Am I, am I biblically formed? Am I biblically formed once I've read my word today and I, and, I, you know, and I try and apply it to my life? Am I biblically formed? Need to pray? Okay. Pray is good. Praying, praying is a good thing. I'm sorry? Dedication time. Okay. I know a lot of people that read their little books, their little uh, daily bread, yeah, devotionals, and, and they say, man, this is really, really good. I really needed this today. And then they go and live their life. And what, whatever it was, that devotional, it gave them a good feeling. It allowed them to, it encouraged them, it lifted their spirits. And then they just went about their day. Is that being biblically formed? No. Being biblically formed is changing the way you do things, changing the way you think, changing the way you act. And in my opinion, one of the most important things is changing the way you react. Because if you want to know how strong your flesh is today, have to react to something. Because when you react to something, it's instantaneous and it's going to either going to be spirit or it's going to be flesh. And if it's flesh, whoo, you, you're going to be able to tell it right away. You're going to be able to tell if it's flesh reacting. If it's spirit reacting, praise God. But we need to be biblically formed to the point where we can control the flesh so the flesh doesn't react. The spirit reacts. So the spirit is in control to the degree that we rely on it to react and not our flesh. That doesn't happen overnight. That does not happen overnight. You can get the Holy Ghost today and not be that way tomorrow. It takes time to learn this. So don't get down on yourself. If you fail today, get back up. Start again tomorrow. Work on it. We're, this is a process through which we are all walking. None of us have arrived. We all need to go through this process every day. Discipline. Yes. Yes. We need to be. We need to be disciplined in the things of God. You know, a lot of people. There's a lot of religions that have a lot of disciplines in their, in their faith. The Muslim faith, they pray five times a day. There's a lot of discipline in that. And there's, I mean, that's, that's wonderful to be able to, to discipline yourself to do that. It's not going to get you to heaven, but it's wonderful to be able to discipline yourself to do that. So discipline is an important thing, but we've got to be disciplined to the right things. And that's why we have to be biblically formed. It is the Bible that we need to discipline, discipline ourselves to because the Bible is the roadmap of our life. It is the thing that God has given us to teach us how to walk in this world without walking in sin. Okay? So we're biblically formed. The next thing we talked about was being, anybody remember? Sacrificially generous. Sacrificially generous. Yep. No. We did sacrificially generous first. Trust me on this. Sacrificially generous. Okay. What does that mean? That means that you, when you, when you are, when you're generous with somebody, what's a sacrifice? Got to hurt. Got to hurt. You know, the old woman came to the, came to the, came to the, uh, uh, 
came to the temple and she gave two, two pieces of coins. And Jesus called all of his disciples. He said, look at this, guys. Look at this. This is exciting, guys. All these other people, they gave out of what they have. She didn't give out of what she had. She gave everything she had. She made a sacrifice. But Jesus, it's only two coins. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference. She gave everything. She, gave a sac she made a sacrifice when she gave what she gave. God doesn't care about the amount. He's got a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. What does he need your money for? What he needs is your sacrificial generosity. He needs you to not love money. That's the whole goal of being sacrificially generous. Not to love money. To trust God. And if God asks you to give your whole bank account, how much do you trust him? I'm, I'm just letting that sink in. All right? Because it's happened. It's happened. There are people that live their lives that way. I was in the military. I knew a guy in the military. He belonged to a faith. He was a Christian. I don't know what denomination he belonged to. He lived on 10% of his income, and he gave 90% to the church. And he lived on the tithe. And he was doing good. There was, I mean, he had everything everybody else had. But he believed what the Bible says when it says that God's going to take care of him. He believed it, and he lived it. All right? So being sacrificially generous... I'm not going to tell you how to do that. That's between you and God. All right? But God's going to ask you to do things. God's going to speak to you to do ridiculous things. And you're going to say, what are you talking about? Because that's exactly what I did. Exactly what I did. I'm not going to do that. But I eventually did it. But God is going to ask you to do ridiculous things. He just wants to know. Just like Abraham sacrificing his son. He didn't do it because he didn't know what Abraham was or wasn't going to do. He wants Abraham, he wants you to know what you're willing to do. He wants you to understand how much you love and trust him. It's not because he doesn't know. It's because he wants you to know. Sacrificially generous. What's the, what was the next one? Morally discerning. Telling right from wrong. Being able to understand right from wrong. Okay? Being able to tell if the person that's standing in front of you that's teaching you or trying to, trying to explain something about their faith is telling you something that's right or wrong. Or if that phone call that you get that says, I've got this... Uh, I got this great deal for you. Is that something I should jump into or is that something that I should walk away from? Or, or that person at the office that says, could you please go pick up a, a six-pack of beer for the party tonight? What's your answer to that? To be morally discerning is to know, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay? We've got to be ambassadors. We've got to be examples of Jesus Christ to the world around us. We've got to be willing and able to say no to things that are morally wrong. <clears throat> I work in a company and I do credit and collections. One of the first things I told my boss was I'll do, I'll do anything that's moral, ethical, or, I um, can't remember the third one. But anyway, if it's illegal, if you're going to ask me to testify on, on the stand to say something that's not true to advantage the company, I'm not going to do it. Don't ask me to do it because I'm telling you right now I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. Okay? So we've got to know when, it, when to say yes and when to say no, and that is being morally discerning. 
And then last week, we opened the uh, subject of being relationally healthy. And what did we talk about last week? What relationship did we talk about last week? Husbands and wives. And we looked at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And what were the three keys to the marriage? In Je- from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Leave, cleave, and become one. So you gotta, you got to leave the old commitments behind. you got to break some old dependencies. you got to cleave to your wife. You've got to, and notice this is directed at the men, not the women. The leaving and the cleaving is directed to the men because we're the ones that need this training. We're the ones that need this instruction. Women are going to love. Women love. That's what they do. That's what they're built to do. They love. Us men, we need this training. We need to leave the old dependencies behind. We need to cleave to our wife, and we need to become one flesh. I pointed out last week, and I want to point it out again this week. Show me in there where it says anything about love. Love has nothing to do with it. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, Love had nothing to do with marriage. Dad and mom, or dad primarily, picked who you were going to marry, and that was both men and women. And the leaving, the cleaving, and the becoming one flesh created a bond that turned into love, that became love. All right? So we put a lot of emphasis on love in this society. And we think if we've got to love somebody to, be, to, to have a good match, all right? And that's probably true. But that emotion, that feeling that you feel, that thing that's all tingly inside of you, that's going to go away eventually. And you're going to have to have something else in that relationship to keep it bonded together. You need to leave, cleave, and become one flesh. All right, so that's where we've been. We're moving on. Amen. So tonight we're going to talk about all those other relationships so that we can be relationally healthy. Uh, so first I want to talk about the family, the, the, the parent-child relationship. Parent-child relationship. First thing, what's the most important thing to the growth and health of a child? What's the most important, from a parent's perspective, what's the most important thing you can give your child? Love? Okay. What's the next most important thing you can give your child? Safety? Well, what I'm thinking about is a, <laughs> is a husband and a wife, a mom and a dad, and a, and a dad that loves mom and a mom that respects dad, okay? That unity between parents, that that brings that child up in a point of security. They don't have to worry about dad coming home and beating everything up, or mom not being able to to do what mom's supposed to do during the day when dad's gone. They That bond of love and that bond of respect between the parents is the most important thing you can give your child. All right? So, when we're talking about the parent and child relationship, there's a lot of different ways that parents can look at their children and and, uh, identify or see their children. They can see them as, these are the people in my house that should be seen and not heard. Don't make any noise. I had a friend of mine once in the military, he said, man, when my dad came home, my brother and I, we were gone. We just didn't want to even be in the same room with him. I said, why? He says, because if he even saw us, he would take us out to the backyard, and he went out and he bought a truckload of stones, rocks, and put them in the backyard. And he says, see that 
load of stone right there, I want you to move over to that corner of the, of the yard. And that would be what they had to do until all those rocks were moved. And the next time they saw their dad, he would take them out and he said, now I want you to move that load of stones, I want you to put them back over there. They were, he didn't even want to see his kids. And if he saw them, this is what he, this is, this was his interaction with his children. Okay? So he did not only not want to hear them, he didn't even want to see them. Okay? But one, one way you can look at your kids is be, you know, the little people that are seen and not heard. Another way to see your kids is they're the other people that run the house. The kids make the rules, the kids do whatever they want. Okay? Because because I don't want to stand up and discipline them. Another way is that uh, they're just there for me to live my life through them. So I wasn't able to be on the football team, so I want Johnny to be on the football team for me. So no matter what Johnny wants to do, Johnny's going to be on the football team. They're just there to fulfill my desires and my uh, interests. Some people see their kids as their friends. They just want to be friends with their kids. That's a recipe for disaster. And then some people are just waiting. <sighs> there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be a day when they're gone. They're gone. <laughs> Emptiness syndrome. Yes, bring it on. They just can't wait until their kids are gone. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at your kids. A lot of different ways parents can see their kids. But what does the Bible say about how parents should see their kids? That's what we want to look at, okay? We're always interested in what the Bible says because we want to be what? Biblically formed. Biblically formed. So what does the Bible say about this subject? It doesn't make any difference what the subject is. Whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's a controversy, whenever there's a, a disagreement, what does the Bible say about this subject? Because I want to be biblically formed. And the only way I'm going to be biblically formed is to find the subjects that are in conflict and find out what the Bible says about it and then live that way. So we're going to look at what the Bible says about the way we're supposed to treat our children. And the way our kids are supposed to treat us. Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 is where all this information we're talking about, about relationships is. Ephesians chapter 5 is where, the, where it was about the husbands and the wives. Ephesians chapter 6 is what we're going to be talking about next. That talks about the parents and child and all the other relationships that you have. Okay? So Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 says, Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. That's the promise. The promise is that if you honor your father and mother, it will be well with you, and you'll live a long life. I'm in. I want it to be well with me. And I'm really thankful that I've lived a long life. Okay? So kids, and all of you are kids to somebody. Right? There's, there's, not a, there's not a one of you in this room that's not a child to somebody. I hope. I can't think of any situation where you wouldn't be a child to somebody. You want to honor your parents. Some of us, our parents are dead. That doesn't mean we can't still honor them. All right? Verse number four, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but be, uh, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So, first we talk about Paul talks to the kids, and he says to obey and to honor. Are, this, is, are these two things the same thing? Is obeying your parents and honoring your parents the same thing? No? What's the difference? Obeying? 
doing what they tell you to do? Okay, you may not want to do what you're telling them to do, okay. Okay. Okay, what can I do to help you? That's very close, very close. Obedience, the word obedience here, the, the, the uh, root word is to hear. To hear with your ears, to hear. Okay, so when it talks about obedience, it talks about listening, listening. I'm supposed to listen to what my parents tell me. I'm supposed to listen not only to the words they say, but I'm supposed to listen to the intent behind the words. Sometimes we do what the words say, but we don't fulfill the intent behind the words. Okay? In the Old Testament, it says, Thou shalt uh, not commit adultery. And they were religiously follow that, don't commit adultery. But that, those, they followed the law, but they didn't follow the spirit of the law, the intent of the law. The intent of the law, Jesus said, was to, that you don't commit adultery in your heart. That's the intent. That's the spirit of the law. Okay? So not only do I want to listen to what my parents say, and do that, but I want to follow the intent of what they're telling me to do. I want to follow the Spirit. I want to be as much uh, 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 obeying them to the degree that they will be able to say, there's nothing that you left undone. Okay? Uh, Sister Overton mentioned how I feel about my obedience. If I'm bitter about it, I can go out and do the thing, but if I'm bitter about it, I'm not being obedient because I'm not, in, I'm not following the intent of what's being told to me, okay? I'm not doing it in love. I'm not doing it in, in joy. I'm not doing it in, in obedience. I'm doing it grudgingly, okay? So obedience is hearing what's said, hearing the intent of what's said, and doing what I've been asked to do. That's obedience. What's honor? I thought the author made a very good point in this, in this lesson, one that I never really thought about. Praise, I can do, uh, if I praise you, I can praise you privately or I can praise you publicly, right? So thankful we have this pastor. I'm so thankful we have our pastor's wife, all right? That's praise. I can do the same thing privately. Honor can only be done publicly. I thought that was really interesting. You can only honor somebody publicly. Now, you may not agree with that, but I really like that. I really like that. So, when it says to honor your parents, it has nothing to do with obeying them. It has to do with talking good about them, holding them up, lifting them up in the eyes of others, honoring them, okay? And that can only be done publicly. And you, if your parents are no longer with us, you can still honor them. You can still tell people about the, the, the things that they did for you and the things that they that they helped you with. You can still honor them. You can still lift them up. So obviously gossiping about them is not honoring them. And, and telling other people about the horrible things that your parents do is not honoring them. And some people do horrible things. Some parents do horrible things. Don't talk about that. Publicly. I mean, you may have to talk about it privately to a counselor or, or, or pray about it or whatever, but that's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about honor, we're talking about lifting somebody up. And the Bible says to honor your parents. And this commandment is the first commandment with a promise. Think about that. God says if you honor your parents... 
that you will, you will have a good life and you'll live a long time. I'm in. I want to do that. I want those benefits. So honor your parents. Lift them up. Tell people good things about your parents. It doesn't seem too difficult, does it? And yet, if you go to wherever kids gather, I don't even know where that is anymore. I, I almost said the mall, but I have no idea where kids gather anymore. When I was a kid, it was the mall. That was a long time ago. But if you go to wherever kids are gathering and you just sit and listen to what they're saying, there's not a whole lot of honoring going on. Okay? And if you're in those conversations, young people, I'm talking to specifically the young people now, if you're in those conversations, don't get dragged down into those conversations. Be morally discerning. Understand that that's not how you want to talk about your parents. All right? Lift them up. If you can only say one thing good about your parents, that's the only thing you need to say. All right? So we are to obey, hear, follow the intent, and do what we're told to do. This is, of course, assuming that what we're told to do is, is, is not sinful. Obviously, if your parents told you to go out and rob the bank or rob a, rob a store, you, you want to be morally discerning and say, no, I think I'll, 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 I'll pass on that one. But, you know, in essence, we're talking about, we're talking about good parents and doing, asking you to do good things. All right? You want to be able to listen, obey, and follow the intent of what they say. And you want to honor your parents. That's the, that's the job of a kid. You now have all the instructions you need. Congratulations. Who's, go, who's ready to graduate? Yeah, good, good. I got some hands in the air. That's good, good. All right, so that's what Paul says to kids. Now, what does he say to parents? And ye fathers, this is verse 4, and ye fathers, propose. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Paul gives both negative counsel and he gives positive counsel here. And I like what the author said so well, I'm going to read it to you. So bear with me because I'm not a very good reader. Provoke not your children to wrath or anger. Biblical anger is a God-given emotion a meant to invoke a reaction when you see or experience injustice. Biblical anger, the Bible, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. So what is biblical anger? Biblical anger, biblical anger is a God-given emotion. So anger is a God-given emotion, if it's used correctly. Meant to invoke a reaction when you see or experience injustice. Has anybody ever experienced any injustice? Have you ever been accused of doing something you didn't do? Yeah, everybody's hands should be in the air. We have all experienced injustice. And we've all seen other people experience injustice. Okay? Paul says that you should not treat your children unjustly so as to give them uh, no alternative but to be angry. So parents, don't treat your children unjustly. Don't be in injustice to your kids because if you do, they have a right to be angry with you. That doesn't sound right. What do you mean my kids have a right to be angry with me? Well, don't treat them unjustly. All right? Don't assume they've done something wrong. Find out what happened. Find out what happened. My daughter used to get my son in trouble all the time because she would go to him into doing things I had told them not to do. And she would press and press and press until he finally did it. And all of a sudden, there I was. And I'm looking at him. And I didn't hear the conversation before. 
and he got in trouble, and she not. All right? That's, that was an injustice on my part. I, was, I, I failed in those situations, okay, because I didn't thoroughly investigate. Maybe I did. Maybe I just didn't believe him. Right? You got one child saying one thing. You got another child saying another thing. The younger, who are you going to believe, the younger or the older? You know? So just have to be careful as parents. We have to be careful as parents. We want to make sure that we don't provoke our children to wrath or to anger by being unjust to them. Okay? So that's the negative part of this. Uh, another thing about that, don't provoke your children to wrath. And we're assuming that the parents are united here, that they're Christian parents, but that's not always the case. Not everybody in the church has united parents. Okay? So another way that parents can provoke their children to wrath is to be unjust to each other. And the kids see that. Kids aren't stupid. They know exactly what's going on, even when it's behind closed doors. They know when the yelling and screaming starts. They know when things are being picked up. They're not stupid. So we as parents, and again, I'm sure you don't do this, but don't provoke your children to wrath because you're, you're demonstrating your uh, anxiety with each other in public. And in public, I mean in the living room when the kids are watching. Take that someplace else where the kids aren't going to be there and deal with it in love. Okay? That's another way that sometimes we men can provoke our children to wrath because we're angry with our wives. And mama is the most important thing. I don't care, I don't care who you are, dad. In a little child's life, mama is the most important thing. That may change as the years go by. But don't provoke your children to wrath, to anger, by, by uh, public displays of ineffection. So that's the negative uh, counseling. Then we have the positive counseling, which is parents, fathers, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. These words mean, nurture means to ed education or training. It means discipline and correction. In the nurture, the discipline and correction of the Lord. Admonition, that means instruction or teaching. So we could rewrite this first to read, Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. That's what us parents are supposed to do. What does Pastor Overton say every time he dedicates a child? Parents, it's on you to be the example. Your kids are going to see what you do and do what they see. Right? It's my job as a parent. And my job as a parent never stops. I've got, I got two adult children living in my house and four junior children, grandchildren living in my house. I'm still parenting. Not as overtly as I used to, but I'm still parenting. Okay? Not only am I parenting the young ones, but I'm still parenting the older ones. It's different now, but I'm still doing it, all right? And it's got to be the way the Lord wants it. What does it say in Deuteronomy chapter 4? Talk to him about God in the morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Talk to him about that in the morning, it says. Talk to him about that at noonday. Talk to him about that. At the you know in the in the midday. They they had places on their doorposts that every time you walked out the door, you kiss it and you touch it. That's to remind you. Deuteronomy six and four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. When they pray, they strap things on their arm 
where they put things on their forehead to remind them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the, and the subsequent scriptures to that about how to teach them daily to your children. There's a whole system in the, in the Old Testament about remembering. There's a whole system about remembering. We don't really have that built into our society about remembering God and remembering the things of God. And I wish I had this understanding earlier in my Christian life that it's my responsibility to remember the things of God. It's not only to, to learn the things of God, but to remember. Because I can know it in the morning and forget it, you know, in the afternoon when I need it. I need to remember. They used to wear prayer shawls, and they had these little tassels at the end of their shawl. And the tassel was there to help them to remember, to remember. So they'd wear this thing all around all the day, and it would be bumping up against their knees all day. And you'd think it'd be annoying. No, it's a remembrance tool to remember, okay? So we need to teach our children to be disciplined. We need to teach our children the Word of God. We need to teach our children the, uh, the truth of the Word of God, all right? So there's the instructions to the parents. Don't cause your children to be angry and Train them up in the way that they should go. All right? Any questions on, on parenting? That's probably an open question that I shouldn't ask because I'm not qualified to answer it. All right. So the next relationship we want to talk about is the employer-employee relationship. Most of you are either have been employed are employed or will be employed. I think that covers just about everybody. Yeah. So when we read these scriptures, when I read these scriptures, I always think about the employee side of it. Because I've never been an employer. I've never been the boss. But we should really concentrate on both sides of this equation. Because if you think about it, when you're a parent, you're an employer. You have little people that you're responsible for, and they're, they can be seen as your employees, okay? You shouldn't think of them that way. Don't get me wrong. But this really fits if you think about it. So, again, we're going to Ephesians chapter 6, verse, this time verses 5 through 9. Now, this is a servant-master relationship that Paul's talking about. We in this country don't like to talk about servant-master relationships. But when you understand that this was a normal, natural relationship that was established, has been established throughout many centuries, and it was a normal thing in the day that Paul wrote it, and so we shouldn't, we shouldn't condemn it because of its, because of its, uh, 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 the words that they use, okay? It's very easy to just change us into an employer-employee relationship, understanding that they're not equal. They are not equal. Servant-master, employee-employee, employer-employee is not an equal relationship, but the principles still apply. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ, not, as, uh, I serve, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, uh, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good things any man doeth, the same shall be received of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, Forbearing, threatening, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the employees. I'm trying to hurry here. First, this is, re, this is important to understand 
that this is uh, talking about your service according to the flesh. Servants, obey, be obedient to them uh, that are your masters according to the flesh. So this is talking about your masters that are not your spiritual guides. These are the people that you work for, your boss or your supervisor, okay, according to the flesh. So don't expect them to give you spiritual advice. Don't expect them, if they're not a Christian, don't expect them to treat you like a Christian would treat you because they're not going to do it. It's, 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 it's tough, but it's, we shouldn't expect them to do it, all right? This word obedience here, it's the exact same word as obey back in chapter, uh, verse number one, where it's talking about the, talking to the kids to obey your kid, to obey your parents. What's that mean? It means to listen. It means to listen to the intent of what's being said and do what's, do what they're asking you to do with the intent of what they're asking you to do. Don't just do the bare minimum. Well, you know, I filed those papers the way you want. I filed those papers. Yeah, but, you know, what about this other stack of papers? Okay? It's, we need to follow the intent of what they want us to do, not just the instructions of what they want us to do. All right? So we need to be obedient. It's the same word. It says, uh, um, yeah, servants, be obedient to them that have the rule over you according to the flesh. This is uh, physical obedience according to the flesh. It's not, a, it's not an authority. It's not a spiritual authority. Verse number six, it says, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from heaven. So we need to be What's that? Heart. Thank you. From the heart. I'm sorry. She's always going to keep me from messing up. All right. So we don't want to pretend to be working. We don't want to pretend to be working. We don't want to actually do the work. We actually want to obey. We don't want to just let people think we're obeying. You know, we actually want to do the work. It says not as eye service, not with eye service, not as man pleasers. We want to do it as if we're doing it for God. Because you're an example of, of God on the earth. And if you don't treat your employer in the right way, you're giving God a bad name. Right? If you only work half-heartedly, they think all Christians are half-hearted workers. Because you're the example for them. So we need to listen and obey. And we need to actually work, do the work. It says, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. All right? So when I go to work, who am I working for? If I have it in my mind that I'm working for God, my attitude is going to be different than if I have it in my mind that I'm working for old Mr. What's-His-Name back there who doesn't really like me that much and barely says hello to me, and when he does talk to me, he yells at me. That's him. Yeah. Or her. I want to be politically correct here. No, I'm not working for him. I'm working for God. God gave me this job. God wants me here for a reason. And maybe that reason is to show Mr. Boss what a Christian is. And if I give a bad example of what a Christian is, I'm not doing my job for God. So I need to be working for God. I need to have my focus as if I'm working for God. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm losing my place here. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, 
Listen to this. Listen to this. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, no matter whatever good thing you do at work, whatever good thing you do at work, it says you're going to receive the same from God. If you're a lazy worker, that's what you're going to get from God. If you're not an obedient worker, that's what you're going to get from God. I don't want that from God. I want God's best. So I'm going to do what I can to make sure that I represent God well. Amen? All right. So that's the employee side of it. Do the work. Hear, listen, do the work. Work as if, as if you're working for God. What about the employer side of the relationship? Anybody here an employer? You were? Not anymore? Anybody here a boss at work? Got one back there? Boss at work? Okay. You don't have to be an employer to be a boss. If, you're, if you work for a big company and you're in charge of a section and you've got five people under you or 35 people under you, you're a boss, okay? You don't have to be necessarily an employee, but you, if you're a boss, okay? Here's what he says to the bosses. Verse number nine, and ye masters, do the same thing unto them. What does that mean? Do the same thing. What's, what same thing should I be doing? All the things that I talked about as a, as a employee, listening, doing the work, you know, doing it as unto God, employers, do the same thing. Do the same thing. Don't think that you're above everybody else. Don't think that you're greater than anybody else just because you're the boss. Don't think that you're all that and you can push people around and not care about how they feel and, and just, you know, get the job done. You know, Jesus told a parable, this is, relates a little bit, about the, about the man who owed the, owed the king uh, millions of dollars and, the, and he begged the king to forgive him and the king forgave him. And he went about and he, he found somebody who owed a couple thousand dollars and he put that man in prison. Because he couldn't pay that. And when the, when the king found out about it, he, he took, he put all the debt back on that man. He put all the debt back on that man. Okay? That just blows me away. I get forgiven of a million, millions of dollars, and now I owe it all again? I had 15 minutes of a really, really nice time. I'm not getting that, I'm not getting that 15 minutes back. All right? So that's what this is talking about. Don't think that because you're above everybody else that you can start pushing people around. Do the same thing. What's the old golden rule? What's that say? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How do you want to be treated as an employee? Every boss has a boss. How do you want your boss to treat you? That's how you should treat your employees. Every boss has a boss. So it says, you masters, do the same thing unto them. Forbearing, threatening. What's that mean? Don't threaten them. Don't threaten them. How many of you ever gone to work and somebody threatened you? If you don't do this, you're going to get fired. If you don't do this, I'm going to cut your, cut your salary. If you don't do this, you're not going to get, you know, whatever the threat might be. Don't threaten them. Knowing, why? Knowing that your master also is in heaven and he doesn't respect anybody. He has no respecter of persons. Remember, as you treat other people, that's how you're going to be treated. Be good to people. I believe this with all my heart, with all my heart. If we could just learn to be kind. You don't even have to love them. Just learn to be 
kind. Just be kind to people. If you're kind to people, that will solve 99.999% of the problems. Just be kind. All right? So he says, forbearing one another, knowing that your master in heaven, we've already covered all that. So that's the employee relationship, the employer relationship, okay? Be good to your people. Pretend they're your kids. Now, you, they may be older than you. I've got a boss who's 30 years old, okay? I'm sure he doesn't see me as his child. But if you're a boss... Pretend they're your kids. How would you treat your kids? You know? And they will appreciate it. I guarantee you, they will appreciate it. They may never tell you they appreciate it, but they will appreciate it. All right. So we've taken care of the employee-employer relationship. Two more to go. Conflicting relationships. Have you ever had a relationship that was a conflicting relationship? Woo! Boom, 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 boom. I used to work for a guy, not for him, but there was a guy. I worked with a lot of people in the military because you move around a lot, you different people. His name was Dino. And we had an old saying. He, would, he, he, had, a, he had a pension for stabbing people in the back. And we'd go, oh, oh. Dino Graham. <laughs> Dino Graham. So it was always, there was always a conflict with Dino. Always a conflict with Dino. If you see Dino coming, <clears throat> we all have had people in our lives that brought conflict. Amen? So for this, we want to go to Colossians chapter 3, which says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. If you remember last week, what did I talk about last week about going to the airport? What do you do before you go to the airport? You pack your bags. You pack your bags. Everybody is walking around with baggage. Everybody's walking around with baggage. You can't see it, and they're not going to tell you about it. You've got it too. We're all carrying baggage, okay? So when you interact with another person, Allow them to have their baggage. Allow them to have their baggage. And that baggage may cause them to interact with you in an unpleasant way for you. Allow them that opportunity. Because they don't know what's going on, they don't understand it, and you just happen to be the target of opportunity. And you being that target of opportunity, if you put on, therefore, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, if you act humbly, and if you are meek, and if you are long-suffering, that's going to go a long, long way in diffusing the conflict. If you are, if, if someone comes and, a, and verbally attacks you for, for no apparent reason to you, what's your natural, what's the flesh say you're supposed to do? Rah! <laughs> Defend, fight or flight, right? That's what our flesh tells us to do. But what do we talk about at the very beginning of this lesson? To be biblically formed is not to let the flesh react. It is to let the spirit react. And the spirit reacts with love and gentleness 
and kindness and meekness and long-suffering. That's being biblically formed. Who's there? Who's, who's, who's attained that? Who's got that down? Who's, who's willing to stick their hand up in the air? Yeah, brother, you, you, you're there? All right, good. One person. I'm not there. I've been in this thing a long time. I'm not there. My flesh still riles up, rises up. All right? This is talking about being biblically formed. This is how we're supposed to react when people are uh, mean to us. We're supposed to react with kindness. We're supposed to let them get it off their chest. Some of you, I, I know some of you don't agree. I understand that. I understand that some of you don't agree with what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It's fine with me if you don't agree. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It says, forbearing one another. What, is for, what does that word forbearing mean? We talked about it earlier. Lifting them up. Lifting them up. Forbearing one another. And forgiving one another. So they just yelled at you. Forgive them. They didn't ask me to forgive them. doesn't make any difference. The Pharisees didn't ask Jesus to forgive them. And he from the, from the, from the cross said, Father, forgive them. Be proactive. Forgive them. Forgive them. If any man have a quarrel against thee, even as Christ, oh, here we are. Even as Christ has also done to me. Got to follow the example of Jesus. Aren't we talking about being biblically formed? Aren't we talking about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? Aren't we talking about being humbly submitted? Aren't we talking about changing our choices, changing our actions, and changing our reactions? Aren't we talking about being more like Christ? Oh, Gotta be more like Jesus. Man, this is a lot of work. It is. You're right. It is. Look, if this was easy, everybody would be doing it. If this was easy, the whole world would be on the train, be on the Jesus train. You know? It's not easy. It's not meant to be easy. It is to control your flesh. And people do not want to control their flesh. They are happy to let their flesh run things. We want to be biblically formed. Conflict, conflict, relational conflict. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. We're supposed to love people. Love even as you are loved. By who? By God. Love as you are loved by God. I love this last verse, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called of one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Do you know what that word rule there means? I looked it up. I was shocked. That word means umpire. Look it up under Strong's. Umpire. What does an umpire do? He calls balls and strikes. You're safe. You're out. Let the peace of God. Now, you've got to have the peace of God for this to work. If you don't have the peace of God, this won't work. So you've got to have the peace of God. But let the peace of God call 
what you're supposed to do. Let the peace of God instruct you on how to handle this situation. When you don't have a word, a specific word from God, the peace of God is there to show you what the right step is. How important is it to have the peace of God? Let the peace of God be the umpire in your life and give you the instruction. Call the balls and strikes. I love that. Love, love, love that. All right. So we've gone through everything. We're going to do one more relationship, and that is the friendship relationship. Is this okay? Can I go a couple more minutes? We all right? Okay, friendship relationship. Who here has a friend? Good. Don't keep your hands up. Don't put your hands down. Did I give you permission to put your hands down? Okay, good. I just want to make sure everybody's hands up. Who has a really, really good friend? Okay, good. How many really, really good friends do you have? One, not many. I see one finger up. I see one finger up. I have five fingers, six fingers, three, one, okay. First of all, it's hard to find a really good friend. That's the first thing. It's hard to cultivate, find and cultivate a really good friend. But second, why is it so hard to keep a lot of good, really close friends? Why is it hard to keep a lot of really close friends? Anybody have any ideas? What's that? It takes effort. Friendship is something you have to work at. You can't just be a really good friend to somebody and be casual. That's not called friendship. That's called acquaintance. Okay? So really good friends take time. And if you have 15 really good friends, you better not have a job. Because they're going to be taking up all your time. And they're going to be conflicting with each other for being your good friend. you got to be careful about the friendships that you establish and those people that you invest your time into. Okay? And sometimes you have to give up. Maybe that's not the right word. Sometimes you have to postpone or delay or put aside for a time one friend so that you can do something else for another friend. And hopefully if they're a really good friend, they will understand and they will accept that. But God is going to ask you to do some things that's going to require you to suspend some of those really good friends because he's going to ask you to teach a Bible study or to invest some time into a new person in the church that is going to be demanding on your time. And you might have to give up. You you might have to talk to your really good friend and say, look, I'm, I'm focused somewhere else right now. I, you know, I just pray that you, you, you be there when, I, when, I'm, when God lets me come back. But, but friendship is, a, is, a, uh, is, is, is something you have to work at. It's something that you have to think about. It's something that you have to do. It's, it's not just some, some people just fall into it. Some people just have that personality every time they walk into a room. They, are, they make a room full of friends. But uh, that's not really a friend. That's just somebody that's charismatic. And they're not, you know, you, you can't call up that person at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, I'm on the road between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and my car broke down. Can you come get me? That's a friend. That's a friend. All right? The Bible says if you want to have friends... What's it say? Be friendly. Be friendly. I complain to my wife all the time that I don't have any friends. Not so much now. I used to complain all the time. Not so much now. I used to say, man, I just don't have any friends. Well, 
The problem was not the people I was, the problem was not out there. The problem was in here. This is the problem. So I'm not a very friendly guy. As a matter of fact, somebody told me, and I appreciate this person telling me that, that, Brother Vogler, you're very standoffish. You're hard to get to know. Well, I, I know that. I, I'm sorry. It's just the way I am. I don't want to be that way. It's just that's the way I'm designed. It's the way God made me. Okay? But if you want to have friends, be a friend. Find somebody and be a friend to them. All right? So there's some things you don't want to do to or against your friend. You don't want to gossip to your friend, and you don't want to gossip about your friend. You don't want to gossip about your friend because they're your friend. And I guarantee, mark it down, it's going to get back to them. It's going to get back to them. They're going to find out. They're going to find out what you said. Now, here's the thing. What they're going to find out is that you said something. What they're not going to find out is what you said. Because by the time they hear it, it will have been so broadened and so ballooned and so, uh, you know, so grown out of proportion there's not probably going to have much relationship to what you actually said. So don't do it. Don't put yourself in that position. Don't gossip about your friends. Don't gossip about anybody. That's even a better rule. But never, ever, ever gossip to your friends. Why? Because you're planting a seed. And the seed is... If they're willing to say this about that person, what are they saying to that person about me? So I think you can, I think you can say from that, don't gossip at all. But you don't ever want to gossip to your friend, and you don't ever want to gossip about your friend. They're your friend. All right? Um, Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 9, it says, this is the last half of the verse, it says, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So when you start to separate people, you, you stop being a friend. You started being an enemy. What should friends do? Proverbs uh, 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend should be honest with you. You should be big enough to allow your friends to tell you the truth about yourself. I was thankful when that person told me how I am perceived. I was thankful for that. I appreciate that. So when, some, when a friend of yours, not an enemy, not somebody who's gossiping about you, not somebody who's out to hurt you, not somebody who's, whose intent is to harm you, but when a friend comes to you and says, look, there's an issue here, you need to deal with this. There's something here in your life that God has showed me, or, there, or there's a, you know, you did this and it's not cool, whatever it might be. You have to be willing to accept that and hear it. And pray about it and let, because God wants to expose stuff in our lives to us so that he can deal with it in our lives. And a lot of times that comes from our friends. Who else is it going to come from? Because if, if an enemy comes up to you and says that, you're going you're gonna to write it off. It may be true. But you're not going to listen to it because of the source. So God will often use friends to tell us things about ourselves that are hard to hear. We've got to be big enough to allow him to do that. The last category is church family, church relationships. Everything I've said so far all applies to the church double. 
don't let your church brothers and sisters offend you. Just make up your in your mind. Make it up in your mind. Just decide right now. Nothing that anybody in this body does is going to offend me. They don't mean it to offend me. I'm not going to allow it to offend me. I'm not going to accept it as an offense. It's done. It's over with. I've made the decision. I don't have to think about this again. And if someone does something that you feel offended by, just be gentle with them. Pick a time and talk to them about it. And if they accept it, fine. If they don't accept it, fine. Whatever. I said something to a brother in the church. I think it was last year. Oh, man, I felt bad. Oh, oh I felt bad by what I said. I could not find a time that day to talk to him. But about three weeks later, I got a chance to pull him aside and say, brother, I'm so sorry. I know what I said to you could be seen as an offense, and I really want to apologize for what I said to you. I, it, it just, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't mean it that way. I pray that you forgive me. All right? So if you offend somebody, or if you feel like you've offended somebody, they may not even realize it, but go to them because it will become a weight on you. It will be something that will live in you until it's dealt with. All right? So our church family is our family. And we should love them. Why do we, why do we call ourselves brothers and sisters? Because we're family. Sibling rivalries. There's all kinds of stuff. Let's just love each other. Let's give the other person some mercy. Let's give them some kindness. Let's allow them to be who they are until God makes them who he wants them to be. He's done that for me. He's allowed me to be who I am until he's created me what he wants me to be. Amen? We want to be relationally healthy. Relationally healthy. And that's what all the stuff we've been talking about. How to live our lives, how to, be, how to relate to other people. Let's stand. I hope this has been of some help to somebody. Lord, we, we love you tonight and we thank you for the instruction in your word that tells us specifically how we're supposed to act and how we're supposed to react in every relationship in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be biblically formed to the point where when we act or when we react to conflicting situations, it is not our flesh that is reacting, Lord, but it is your spirit that reacts. Help us, Lord, to be able to allow people to be who they are until you make them what you want them to be. Lord, I just pray that this word would go forth, that it would have anointing, that your will would be done in and through it, Lord. I pray that you bring us back here to this place on Sunday, fired up and ready to praise you and worship you and be a, a part of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. We have. Uh,